And thank you very much for coming along to this really important conversation, Dying with Dignity. My name's Tracy Spicer. I actually think, after speaking to several messaging experts, that we should probably change the name of this panel because a lot of people say that the language is not right, this expression, Dying with Dignity, but we'll get onto that in a few minutes. Um, I'd like to introduce you to these two extraordinary human beings on my Far left, your right, broadcaster and director and founder of Go Gentle Australia, Andrew Denton. <laughs> you would all know Andrew, of course, through various iterations. His performing credits include TV shows, blah, 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 The Money or the Gun, Live and Sweaty and Enough Rope. As executive producer, The Early Chaser Project, Screw and Transfer and Hungry Beast. He's done just a few things. <laughs> In 2015, his podcast series, Better Off Dead, looking at the arguments for and against assisted dying, went to the top of the, the iTunes charts. Who has listened to that podcast? Show of hands. It's uh, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Next to me, I have an extraordinary advocate, voluntary euthanasia, law reform advocate, Jenny Barnes. Jenny worked as a secretary for several years before being accepted to nursing at the Nursing Education Centre of New South Wales. She's worked in a variety of settings from aged care in Cairns to acute and subacute wards in Victoria, both in the city and regional areas. Her most recent role as Assistant Nursing Unit Manager at Bass Coast Health ended on the morning of May 26, 2016, at the end of a shift when she was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour. Jenny, can I ask you first, when you were a young nurse, what was your opinion about assisted dying or voluntary euthanasia as it was known then? Well, assisted dying, assisted dying not so much, but certainly I was aware when patients would come to a ward that were definitely what I would say at end of life, uh, that you were aware that there needed to be something else available for, for them that, um, that sometimes the pain and suffering we couldn't manage and the family was struggling with the, the, the situation that the family found themselves in. So I've always had a strong uh, bent towards uh, end of life um, and uh, I, I have at, at work uh, always been uh, cognizant of the fact that um, when our patients, especially our elderly, come into uh, EDs and are brought around to the ward and, and you say, well, you know, what are your end-of-life wishes? Uh, it, we sort of uh, uh, put to them that, you know, in the event that they had uh, a cardiac arrest, would they want to be resuscitated and uh, questions of that nature. And um, a lot of them really haven't thought about it and, or they think about it and they say, well, of course I want to live. Uh, but they don't understand, yes, of course we want them to live too, and if we can, we want them to be able to, to uh, get better and to go home to their life as they knew it before they came in. But that's not always the case, and, and, their, and their situation, such as with Andrew's father, when he was, uh, had the, the heart condition and at the end of his life, you know, they're struggling to breathe. They're, they're not getting better. Do, do they really want to, to um, continue on knowing full well that they could be happy the, the, uh, the oxygen cylinder beside them, they can only walk a couple of steps, they're in pain, um, they're distressed, their family's distressed, and, 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 and the next step is, is possible nursing home, if, if, if at all, uh, or in a hospital bed looking at four wards. That for me, that didn't appeal. But for um, uh, for others, uh, that might might suit them. But, uh, so consequently, I've always been an advocate, and I, I sort of at work. I know it sounds bizarre, but I used to be known as the well, I used to call myself the NFR queen because I wanted people to have a not for resuscitation if it suited them. Um, but you know, it doesn't suit everybody, as I say. And and it's because of the laws in the land, it's not something that you go in and say, "Do you want to?" You know, do you want us to give you an extra injection or whatever else? You know, people shouldn't be left to suffer at the end of life, and certainly not left to suffer at the end of life because of the imposed moral morality and religious views of others. Dad died of congestive heart failure and a bunch of other things, and uh, they did for him then what they can do now, which is legally they up the morphine. 
Um, and I'm sure they did their best, you know, it's not like they were derelict. But morphine doesn't work for everybody. In fact, some people I've discovered, uh, they're resistant to morphine. Morphine magnifies their pain, uh, which is a horrendous thought. And morphine is slow, and this is, you know, why are we talking about law here? Let's just step through what your legal alternatives are in Victoria. And a law, by the way, for assisted dying is, is for a very, very small group of people. It's for the very sickest people in our society whose suffering is such that it's beyond medical relief. And I say suffering because it's more than just pain. It's a whole range of things. So if you're one of those unfortunate people in Victoria, your legal options right now to end your suffering are to take your own life. And we know from your coroner that that's happening at the rate of at least once a week with elderly Victorians and the methods are horrible. Uh, or you can, uh, if, if you want to end your suffering, you can legally refuse all food and fluids and slowly starve and dehydrate to death while your disease takes its course. And that's psychologically very painful. You're physically taken care of as much as a uh, hospital can, but psychologically it's very painful for everyone, including the treating staff. Uh, or you can do a thing called terminal sedation, which is what brings us back to palliative care and warfare. Terminal sedation is where a doctor decides they can no longer do anything for you, that the suffering has got beyond a point where they can help you. Uh, which would be, if a law existed, pretty much the moment where somebody, if legally allowed to, would potentially decide, I'm now going to take medication and die quickly and painlessly uh, with my family around me. But under our system, under our law, what it allows is for a doctor to decide, and they can decide without any consultation with you on this, it's entirely their decision, to slowly put you into a coma. Now, they have to do it slowly, to refer to this with morphine, because if they do it quickly, they can be accused of hastening your death, which is punishable by up to five years of jail. So if you're that patient that's suffering horribly, it's a slow process before you're unconscious. But there's something even more unhappy about this, is that because the doctor has complete power in this situation, if, as a number of our doctors do, and a, a lot of our healthcare is provided by religious institutions, if your core belief is that you will never hasten somebody's death, or if your core belief is that suffering is actually a good thing because Christ suffered on the cross, then you can go as slowly as you like. You can go as slowly as you like giving that pain relief, and you as the patient and you as the family have absolutely no power in that conversation, which is why there are so many testimonies of families having, as you did with your mum, having observed horrible deaths because the law does not protect doctors that want to help patients and does not protect patients that desperately need the help. That's why we need to write new. That really is at the heart of the issue, isn't it? There's this misguided concept in the no of the nobility of suffering. Jenny, sitting here listening to what Andrew just said, having been diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour, how does it feel to you confronting this and knowing that the law is not on your side to protect you from suffering? Well, in my circumstances, in my circumstances it, it, I, assuming that even if the law was passed, supposedly I have 14 to 18 months uh, post-diagnosis of, of my type of brain tumour, um, I think I'll probably outgo that I might be one of the 30% that makes it to the two-year mark. I, I, I don't know. But um, as far as I'm concerned, um, we own a family business and my sons uh, and my husband run that business. Um, and they, my son struggled the, the day we found out that I had a brain tumour by running the forklift into the back door of the shop. <laughs> so that, that, was num that was number one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I got out of hospital and saw the door, I wasn't happy because it was a brand new door. But the, 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 the thing is that what benefit, it, it, I mean, my, my prognosis is, I've already had one episode prior to the second craniotomy where my speech was so jumbled uh, and, and that I was so forgetful and, and putting things down and not being able to find them again and having to go down to Melbourne with the girlfriend taking me that I forgot my purse and she had to lend me money so I could go to the doctors and all the rest of it. Um, so if I'm that jumbled person, um, uh, and I can't write anything down because I can't think of the way to spell it. And I sit there trying to spell cheers 
and I can't work out if it starts with a J or what it starts with, and I, I go through all of that uh, stuff. Um, uh, you know, I mean, that's not me. I mean, as you can see, I can talk underwater. I always have been able to talk underwater, and, and if I can't talk, and if I can't eat, which I always do, uh, they're, 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 that's me. That's what makes me. And 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 I I, um, uh, I then there's the the, the dig indignity of having problems with both bowel and 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 urine problems. You know, I mean, that's not how I want to spend my last days. In the end, you don't know what it's going to be like when you reach that point. And one of the most surprising things to me was when I went to Oregon. America, where this law has existed longest. In fact, one in six Americans now have access to the law we're denied. And in that state, in that country, the law states you have to be terminally ill with six months or less to live to have access to the medication. A tiny number of people use it. But what amazed me is that um, even though all these people are by definition dying of a terminal illness, and they're the ones you'd expect, they're cancer and motor neuron disease and multiple sclerosis, they're all the horrors, almost 40% of them who have the medication, nonetheless choose not to take it. So none of us know what our dying is going to be like. We only know it's our own. Um, point one. Point two, what Jenny said there about feeling a burden. I guarantee that that quote is now going to be taken and used by our good friends at, at the Australian Christian Lobby and Right to Life to explain why these laws are dangerous. Because people like Jenny uh, will be wanting to kill themselves, that's the word that they use, or people will be wanting to kill her because she feels like a burden. And this is one of the great lies told about this. I said before that the reason people access these laws and the reason these laws exist are because of suffering. Suffering is way more than pain. Suffering is the process that as you die, uh, many, many things can happen. Physically, Jenna referred to some of them, uh, the great indignities like incontinence and things like that. Breathlessness, which to you and I means, well, to me it now means going upstairs, but to my <laughs> people, a job for you. But breathlessness in a terminal sense is actually literally feeling like you're drowning all the time. The palliative care nurses I spoke to in St Vincent's at the night shift in Sydney said that would be the one thing they wouldn't want to happen to them. Uh, nausea, the side effects of medication, constipation, diarrhea, fatigue, depression, the suffering of watching your family suffer, which is what Jenny referred to, which is in itself painful. Yes, feeling like a burden may be part of this, because if you've lived your life as an independent person, you don't want to feel like your family is struggling to look after you, even if they don't feel like it's a struggle. So all of this is part of suffering, and these are all legitimate feelings, but they all sit within the all-important context that that person is dying. And it's one of the most cynical things I've seen in this debate. And if you pay attention, you'll see it many times. Those that argue against these laws will drill into that one little statistic. Oh, look, 15% of people said they felt like a burden and say, you can't be killing people because they feel like a burden. There is an awful lot of deliberate double speak and cherry picking, uh, which has been very effective now for 20 years in this country stopping these laws. And an awful lot of myths that you bust on the Go Gentle Australia website. Can you take us through some of the most common myths and bust them for us? Well, the most common myth is uh, the one you would have all heard, which is uh, the slippery slope. Uh, the idea being that once you introduce a law like this, uh, our society is going to descend into some unfettered spiral of killing people and that uh, the way it's explained, for instance, is in uh, Europe, in the Netherlands and Belgium, where it had these laws. The law started for terminally ill people, and now they're assisting people to die who aren't terminally ill. It is true they're assisting people to die who aren't terminally ill. They're assisting people to die that have very long-term illnesses, who may in fact have been contempt to 20 years of suffering. Um, but that's not because their laws have changed. Their laws were written that way in the first place. They were written to help people with unbearable, uh, and untreatable suffering, be it physical or mental. It was never written just for the terminally ill, so that's a common lie told. Um, a very common, probably the most persuasive uh, for MPs uh, catchphrase, basically, is once you introduce these laws, what's to stop greedy relatives 
knocking Grady off of the inheritance. That's that's the that's you. If this was um, the price is right, that would be your top dollar, top dollar one. And and I'll explain what's to stop greedy relatives uh, knocking Granny off. Um, what's to stop it is an understanding of how the law works. The law that's been proposed in Victoria is very clear. You have to have a serious and terminal illness uh, to even begin to qualify for the conversation. You have to persuade not just one, but two doctors, independent of each other, that you actually have that illness and that it's so serious and by law they have to go through all the treatment options with you and that it's untreatable in any other way, that they agree that your suffering is beyond a point where they can help you and then they will write you a prescription which you and only you can choose to uh, fill and take and, and painlessly die from a drinking medication. Now it is extremely difficult to coerce the mythical granny into having a terminal illness she doesn't have. <laughs> and it's even more difficult to coerce two doctors, independent of each other, whose work will be reviewed, unlike now in end-of-life care, where there's no review of what doctors are doing. It's extremely difficult to coerce those two doctors to agree that she has a disease she doesn't have. That's why granny isn't going to be bumped off by these laws, and that's why, if you look at the now mountain mountain of independent peer-reviewed research from the countries where these laws exist, there is no evidence of it. But it is the number one catchphrase piece of bullshit that MPs fall for. And you'll hear it, you'll hear it again and again. And I'm sorry to say that the people have most uh, enthusiastically and, and determinedly trotted out, because I guess it's worked for them for 20 years, are the church, who under the guise of saying, we have to protect the vulnerable in our society, are not just allowing, but enforcing coercion and suffering upon our most vulnerable, because who could be more vulnerable than someone who's dying? That's right. Yes.